interesting show for you. A fascinating show, really. A little bit later, just to tell you what's coming up, we're going to take a look at uh, some skin care. We've been doing kind of a weekly thing on this with uh, David and Mary up at, uh, at Nora. And uh, also, we're going to take a look at something called a hearing ear dog, like a seeing eye dog, but for people who are deaf. That's coming up toward the end of the show. Uh, but first, what I think will be somewhat of a controversial debate. You know, the Bible is probably the world's most widely read book, and some people read it as a source of inspiration. Other people take it as the literal word of God. Dr. Greg Dixon is one of those people who takes it in such a way. He is with the Indianapolis Baptist Temple, and good morning, sir. Nice to see you. It's a pleasure. Also with us is Frank Zindler. Frank disagrees. Frank is a, a noted atheist here in the Midwest. He is the director of the American Atheists of Ohio, and uh, I think I'll let him speak for himself in just a few moments. But Dr. Dixon, I'm going to start with you, sir. Did I characterize you correctly, sir? The Bible is the direct word of God and should be taken literally, please. Yes, Dick, I believe that it is. This is the most amazing book in all the world. And we believe that holy men of old spoke as they were moved of the Holy Ghost. And that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And here's a book that was written over a period of 1,600 years, 44 different authors. Most of them never knew each other and yet not one of them contradicted each other. Not one of them uh, made a mistake as far as the historicity of the Bible is concerned, as far as the uh, literature of the Bible is concerned, the science of the Bible, the prophecy of the Bible. And uh, this Bible has proved itself to me. And this is the book that changed my life. Okay, some rather broad statements there, Mr. Zindler. Well, of course, that was pretty amusing what he said about no contradictions and no errors because the Bible is probably one of the most seriously flawed books in all of literature. Uh, the problems are three in number. Uh, first of all, we don't even know what Bible we're talking about, for sure. We don't know what books should be in, quote, the Bible. We don't know, then, given a particular book, we don't know which contradictory Greek or Hebrew or Aramaic manuscripts should be taken as the type for that particular book. And thirdly, uh, even if we select a particular Greek manuscript, we have no absolute way of knowing what the words in that manuscript meant exactly. That is, uh, the Bible believers are dependent upon scholars such as I to tell them approximately what the Bible uh, words actually meant. You cannot know that absolutely. Uh, I want to get in a quick little uh, commercial here. I published an article in the American Atheist magazine titled uh, The Real Bible Who's Got It, in which I detail all of these things. I'll be willing to send a free copy of this to anybody who writes in for it. Uh, can they write to the station or should yeah. they write well, to we'll my box number? Yeah. Okay. And uh, if they include a couple postage stamps, I'll include this article. Okay, too. Frank, enough of a plug. <laughs> Go ahead. What's the, the book story? of Daniel showing yeah. that the book of Daniel was a forgery, okay? So we don't even know which books should be in the Bible. Now, he's got a defective Bible, the Catholics would say. He uh, is missing six or seven books, which the Catholic uh, people think uh, is the Bible. And both the Protestants and the Catholics today have defective Bibles compared to the Bibles of ancient times. That, feels like, that seems like a fair way to start. How would you respond, sir? Well, in the first place, God is not only responsible to give us an inspired book, but he's also responsible to preserve his book. And if God cannot preserve his word, then it was not inspired to begin with. And um, the fact is, if this is not the word of God, then we have no word from God. And I would simply say to Frank that how would an atheist who doesn't even believe in God even recognize the word of God? Because it wouldn't make a difference how much evidence or proof that a person gave him. He wouldn't believe it because he doesn't believe in God. And so he, he really starts out at the wrong position. In the final analysis, this book does have to be accepted by faith. At some point, a person has to believe that God is not only the God of the Word, but the Word of God. And that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ has not only given to us the written Word, but that He is also the incarnate Word. And uh, uh, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. At some point, you have to move Okay. by faith. We do have to take a break, but when I come back, I want to touch on something that Reverend Dixon mentioned. You contended that there were no contradictions in the Bible, and Frank, you said that wasn't true. Oh, ridiculous. And I think it's important that we establish, in fact, whether there is some, what's going on sure. here, whether that's true or not. We'll continue the discussion. First, a word from H.H. H. Gregg. We'll be right back. <laughs> We 
are back on AM Indiana talking about Bible prophecy with Dr. Greg Dixon and uh, Frank Zindler. And a couple of things I want to help people understand at home because uh, there are lots of different people at home. People that believe in God but do not accept the literal truth of the Bible. People that do not believe in God. A whole bunch of people in the audience. You made the statement, sir, that there were no contradictions. Then a little bit later you talked about ex accepting things on faith. Let's deal with the, the um, contradictions first and then we'll talk about prophecy. Frank Zindler, I'm going to give you one minute. Okay. You have to take your best shot at contradictions and I'll let Dr. Dixon. Okay, let's take something that's practically unarguable. Uh, concerning the reign of Jehoiakim, the last king of, uh, of Judah, in Second Chronicles it says Jehoiakim was eight years old when he began to reign, and he reigned three months and ten days in Jerusalem. A version of that same story in Second Kings says Jehoiakim was 18 years old, not eight years old, 18 years old when he began to reign, and he reigned in Jerusalem three months rather than three months and ten days. Now, one or the other of those is correct, but Jehoiakim could not have been both eight years and 18 years old at the same time. Is that a contradiction? Well, in the first place, it is not a contradiction, <laughs> but I'm not prepared to explain because I came to talk about Bible prophecy. Okay. But if I can come back and talk about the so-called errors of the Bible, we'll discuss this specifically. Well, that was what we were supposed to be discussing, the errors of the Bible, the inerrancy of the Bible. Okay. Well, I was invited to talk about Bible prophecy specifically. Okay, that's fair enough. That, in, in fact, was the original agreement. You brought up the word, con you originally, like in a court of right. law, you mentioned contradiction. Right. I thought Frank should have a right to respond to that. Okay. Does the Bible, in fact, well, I don't have any problem. I'm moving on to that. Does the Bible, in fact, make prophecy that you believe will come true or have, has come true? Well, the Bible <clears throat> is a book of prophecy. The Bible is a prophetic book, beginning clear back in the book of Genesis, clear to the book of Revelation. And uh, there are all kinds of prophecies. There are short prophecies or there's long prophecies. Uh, for instance, uh, the scripture says that uh, Israel would be in the land of uh, Egypt, as an example, for 400 years. And uh, that's exactly how long they were there. And in fact, uh, uh, the Bible teaches that Israel, the, the Jews, would be dispersed throughout all the world and all the nations of the world. And of course, we know that in 70 AD, Titus came into Jerusalem and did, in fact, disperse the Jews. And uh, the Bible said that uh, for many, many years that uh, the land would uh, be desolate. And uh, in fact, the scripture says that uh, there would not even be so much as one tree standing in that land. And we know that the 400 years the Turks uh, were in control of the land of Israel, Palestine, that they literally decimated every tree. They actually used the wood to run their railroads. And uh, <clears throat> we could talk about the prophecies of Christ uh, concerning the crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ. Just that short period of time, three-day period, there were approximately uh, 40 to 50 specific prophecies that were fulfilled at that particular time. Mm -hmm. uh, we could talk about the, the sweep of the nations. Uh, Daniel uh, talked about uh, only four worldwide empires, and we know that that's true. There's well, Frank, I want uh, to jump in. Yeah, of course, I came here to argue the inerrancy or errancy of Scripture. Uh, prophecy was not exactly what I came to argue. I wanted to show that the Bible is totally fallible and contradictory. But this business about the Turks clearing off all the trees, you must think we're awfully gullible. Um, the uh, whole thing of prophecy, prophecies mostly are written after the fact, like the book of Daniel was written several centuries after the Babylonian captivity. And that's why when it prophecies really in the future, it makes so many errors. But let's get to a prophecy that supposedly is uh, ongoing. Uh, in the earliest manuscripts of the Gospel of Mark, the last 12 verses of chapter 16 are missing. Those were fabricated about a century after the earliest manuscripts. In these late verses of the Gospel of Mark, there is a marvelous passage which says that, um, and these signs shall follow them that believe in my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues, they shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Now this is a prophecy for all believers at all time. This isn't limiting it to any particular believers. My calling card has sort of become the use of poison peanuts 
we test very quickly whether the prophecy is true. So would you eat some poison peanuts and show the audience that indeed uh, true believers uh, will not be harmed by okay. taking any poisonous thing? Well, the, script, the scripture says, test not the Lord thy God. Uh, well, no, no, this is God's promise. See, we're not, in fact, if you didn't do this, you would be disobeying God. The Lord, has, the Lord protects his people every day. You're I showing sure lack you of faith now. I thought you were a man of faith. You just told us that you had to have faith. Here it says, well, and that these would be signs shall follow them. That's exactly what Satan yeah. said to Jesus. He said, oh. cast thyself down from the pinnacle of the temple <laughs> well, because it is written that the angels you're waffling will now. hold the... Uh, you're waffling. Here it says clearly... No, no I'm not waffling. Now, wait a minute. This what? is a prophecy. Okay, now, let's, now we want you to... Okay, let's, talk, let's, talk, okay, right? let's talk about this specifically now. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, then Jesus waffled when Satan said, cast thyself down from the pinnacle of the temple because it is written that the angels shall uphold thee. Jesus said, tempt not the Lord thy God. Well, <laughs> Jesus... So, so then the Lord Jesus was w waffled also. Well, I mean, that's... Jesus, uh, that's well, you know, it didn't even exist, so you can hardly... Whoa, 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 wait a second. Wait, 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 that was quite a big statement. That yeah. I did. Well, there's no evidence. Well, we recognize that, that some people don't accept Jesus yeah. as the Lord, but sure. you're, you're suggesting that Jesus did not exist. Um, yeah. Reverend Dixon, I, you better respond to that. Or well, of course, uh, that isn't, uh, of course, that's not something uh, that is a new argument. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are those now that are saying that Jesus was not even a Jew, as an example. And now we have people saying that he didn't exist. We have others, like in the Passover plot, saying that he... Uh, uh, read about the prophecies. Away, <laughs> read about the prof Read about the prophecies of the Old Testament and somehow worked everything out so that he would match up to those prophecies. And but it is an historical fact. Josephus, as an example, uh, who is the greatest Jewish uh, historian, uh, gave evidence to the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ was a historical person. Now that's an interesting thing because Josephus was born after the alleged death of of Jesus Christ. So now how could Josephus have known Jesus Christ? Now, to be sure, there have been some passages which have been shown to be spurious, even though uh, they are there in Josephus. They are quite clearly not written by Josephus. But even if those passages in Josephus were not spurious, they would not prove the existence of Jesus. They simply prove that by the time Josephus wrote, there were people calling themselves Christians, and they had already developed a tradition of a savior who had died. Can, can I just ask one question, sure. and then we will have to take a break and go in the audience, but I still am confused by the fact that if, in fact, one should accept the Bible as literally true, how does one then deal with the fact that, that another reverend reading that book or another human being reading that book might get some different idea of what something meant how does one deal with that? I mean, what, different people can read even something written literally differently, can't they? Well, that may be true, but uh, the fact is the history of the Bible is true, the science of the Bible is true, the prophecy of the Bible is true. And uh, I would be happy to come back, uh, and I think that if we come back to discuss the contradictions, so-called contradictions of the Bible, that ahead of time we should know exactly what we're going to discuss because uh, it, it, we couldn't get any place unless we know exactly specifically what okay. we're talking about. Let, I do want to, I, I think Bible prophecy was the topic and I want to talk about the concept of end times. But, whether, but Dick, yeah. he said the Bible is scientifically accurate. In, in Leviticus it says the hair chews the cud. Now any elementary biology student knows that the hair does not chew Again, the cud. Again, we're into the so-called contradictions. Of course. I'll, no, no, I, this isn't a contradiction, this is just a I will discuss stupidity. that when we come back. So yeah, this is just a Bible Stupidity. Okay. I don't know if this is my fault or not. I thought it was clear what we were discussing, but we'll take a break and let the audience ask their own questions, and hopefully our guests will respond. We'll be back in a moment. <laughs> back and there seems to be some confusion as to what the, actually the topic is. My understanding is it's Bible prophecy, so I'm going to stick with that and then have Frank Zindler hate me because he thinks it was Bible errancy. We'll have you back another time. Reverend Dixon, sir, um, are we indeed, according to the Bible, in the end times? Explain that and tell me whether you think that's true. I believe that's true. Uh, 2,000 years ago, the Bible taught that in the end time there would be a one-world political system and a one-world economic system. It even talks about, in Revelation chapter 13, a mark being put on the head, uh, the forehead, or the, or the arm, or the wrist. Uh, the Bible teaches very clearly that at some point, the number will be equal to the name, and that we will be known by a number. Of course, we know that 
right now everyone is known primarily by the social security number. Here is a uh, uh, magazine article called, uh, out of the magazine called Science 86, April of 86. And they actually show the product code on a man's head. This is not a religious publication. I don't know whether they've... Yeah, we can see it now. That's just all it's right still there, sir. Yes. Now, this is not a religious publication. This is a magazine called Science, April 1986. Here's another one out of the uh, uh, Insight, a new magazine out of Washington, D.C., uh, printed by the Washington Times. Here's the, uh, an article on health. We're not even talking about religion. And there is the universal product code on the arm. This is an example of some of the things that are going to take place beyond the debit and the credit card. Here is a photo, photocopy of a Social Security uh, check from Huntsville, Alabama, uh, from the South Central Bell. Uh, so it's uh, actually uh, uh, something that South Central Bell put out, Social Security number, and before it, prior to that is the number six. Six six. That's very small. You cannot okay, see well, it. Okay. Well, Frank, you're kind of giggling. Okay. So, yeah. yeah. This, uh, this, of course, is a rather interesting superstition. The numerological superstition in the Bible, and this number six six six. If you were a, a Greek scholar, sir, you would know that the oldest manuscripts of uh, the Book of Revelation don't give the number as six 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 as the number of the name of the beast, but rather six one six. And there's even one manuscript that has it six o oh, six. So you have to flip a coin and figure a uh, three-sided coin to figure out which of those three numbers really is the proper number that we should be worrying about on the product code. But as far as the end times are concerned, the end times are long, long past. The end times came at the time of Jesus, if he did exist. In Matthew, it says, learn a lesson from the fig tree. Uh, and then they talk about the leaves and so on. He says, in the same way, when you see all these things, you may know that the end is near at the very door. I tell you this, the present generation, and he's talking about his own generation, the present generation will live to see it all. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will not pass. Now, lest there be any uncertainty as to what generation is meant, in Matthew 16, uh, it says, For the Son of Man is to come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and then he will give each man the due reward for what he has done. I tell you this, there are some of those standing here who will not taste of death before they have seen the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. It didn't happen. If Jesus existed at all, he was a false prophet, but I say he was not a prophet at all. Well, first of all, that specifically referred to the, uh, to the uh, Mount of Transfiguration experience where he was transfigured before their very eyes. No, it eyes. says coming in his kingdom. Then it also refers to, the, to uh, Israel becoming a nation in 1948. No, no, the generation, generation. That's you right. There are people alive that's in right. Jesus' time the generation, who are still alive when The Israel generation that shall see these things come to pass. Now, here, 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 just uh, two things real quick. Uh, this is from the DuPage County Suburban, Daily Suburban Tribune, Friday, June 19, 1981. The Internal Revenue Service, IRS, has decided to stop using the number 666 on income tax forms after a Carol Supreme-based evangelical group pointed out <laughs> that the numbers were being used as a prediction of Jesus Christ's second coming. The IRS oh. was planning to use 666. Right. Greg, Greg, before you show that, I'd just let one gentleman in the audience make a point. Yes, sir. Yeah, I would like to make a point to the atheist speaking directly from 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16 that there are some things in the scripture hard to understand which the untaught and unstable distort as they do also the rest of the scriptures to their own destruction well i would just say you don't know what you are talking about i have not distorted anything i have read the verses exactly as they are they are completely in context i am arguing that we've got to follow the correct context you cannot take these alleged prophecies out of the context they were written for the people who were hearing allegedly jesus voice at that time not for some remote future well frank the scripture says the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of god for their foolishness unto him because they're spiritually discerned you yes. see the problem is the people who are supposedly spiritual men can't agree can they every two of them everyone comes up with a different idea see, why do we have so many sets one other thing i'll tell you very quickly in revelation chapter 13 17 and 18 it talks about the roman empire being revised in the last day and it talks about the ten kings representing the Roman Empire. There, uh, up until just this year, 
there were uh, 10 nations in the common market of Europe. And next year, they will be required to carry an ID number, an, a national ID number, and every one of those national ID cards will have on it 666. Okay, well, uh, and that, what does that prove, Dr. Dixon? I'm still not real clear. Well, the scripture in Revelation chapter 13 <laughs> actually says that there will come a day that every person on earth, in order to buy or sell, will take the mark of the beast, either on their forehead or their hand, and that number is the number of a man, which is 666. Now, here's very interesting. In 1984, the European Common Market met. They meet every year. Here are the ten heads of the European Common Market, and they put out a commemorative stamp. And here is actually a woman sitting on a scarlet-colored beast, and Revelation chapter 17 says that that will be the very emblem of the revised Roman Empire, the woman sitting on a scarlet-colored beast. That and shows that somebody has a good sense of humor, I guess. Um, but we should point out that the book of Revelation almost didn't make it into the Bible. The first few church councils rejected it, and as a matter of fact, Calvin rejected it, Luther rejected it, uh, I'm not quite sure how it is that we've got the book of Revelation anyway, but it certainly was not considered a very good book by the early church, and it certainly wasn't considered intelligible by the main reformers, Calvin and Luther. So we can play with this 666, but again, remember, you're using the wrong number if you use 666. Okay, right. we, we are out of time, believe it or not. This gentleman has some other things to say. I, I, will you, I hope you're both serious if you'd be willing to all come back oh, certainly. and talk I'd about this again. And we will talk about yeah, other aspects of this, and, and Neil, I'm going to invite you back, too. I know we ran short of time. Things go very quickly when they're interesting. <laughs> gentlemen, thank you very much. We'll continue this discussion another time. A word from Eastgate Price. <laughs> short of time, but a couple of quick notes. First of all, if you want more information either about Frank Zindler's position or about Reverend Dixon's position, you can call us at the studio after 11 o'clock for uh, phone numbers. We, re we understand that lots of people are calling the studio now, and I, I hope you all understand that the purpose of a television show like this is to express different points of view, no matter how unpopular either side might be. Uh, we hope you recognize that that is the purpose of a television show like this, and we're glad that you watched. Hope you enjoyed it. <laughs>